Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Missoula Public Library. I'm Dennis Bragg. We're back here in the beautiful fourth floor uh, meeting room uh, looking out over the mountains. I can see Blue Mountain out in the distance, and it's just a lovely evening here as we get through the fall. And, of course, this is Wednesdays with the Mayor. We're pleased to be joined by Mayor Jordan Hess and uh, our audience that's here tonight, and we are welcome uh, welcome all them as well. And if you have questions as we go along through the uh, comments and the discussion tonight, our phone number is 552-6002, 552-6002. So you can always call, call us with uh, information or if you have a question or comment as we go along. Mayor, thank you for being with us again. Absolutely, Dennis. Yeah, it's a Thanks little, little colder again. outside, so we're nice. <laughs> That's what I love about this library. We have these beautiful glass windows, and you can look out over the the, uh, the uh, uh, plaza and everything here. It's really beautiful. So let's move in and talk uh, tonight. I guess we're going to talk about the... Uh, the crisis services uh, levy, which is on the ballot uh, here, this uh, right now, people are voting on that. And let's let's go into a little bit of a discussion about what's involved in this levy. And I think first off, the, the question I have, and people ask me about is why and what's this all about? So let's start out with that. Tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the crisis services levy is um, really to address a pervasive need in um, in Missoula, but but um, a need that we see throughout the region and throughout um, throughout the country, um, and that is um, assistance and intervention for um, people in our community who are experiencing crisis. Um, and um, let's back up and talk about what a crisis is. Um, what what do we mean when we talk about crisis? Um, and, and that's really a broad, a broad term, um, but it is um, most uh, succinctly, I would say, is when um, someone is unable to have their immediate individual needs met. Um, so, you know, maybe your um, nephew um, is, um, uh, falls into depression and um, becomes suicidal. Maybe um, someone um, uh, breaks their knee and is on um, uh, opioids and establishes an addiction. Um, Maybe someone loses their job and is a paycheck away from uh, becoming homeless. Um, maybe someone's the victim of a violent crime and um, needs help navigating um, the, the criminal justice system as a victim. Um, there are um, a range of crises and they can um, involve uh, mental health, they can involve addiction, um, they can involve um, homelessness, but they don't necessarily. Um, it can, uh, these issues can affect all of us. Um, in the next year, um, one in five, 20% of our community will experience um, some form of a mental health crisis. And, and on one hand, it could be um, uh, schizophrenia or psychosis. On the other hand, it could be anxiety or depression. Um, but all of those, um, when untreated, without intervention, um, lead to um, escalating issues. So it's really a case of something that would interfere with, I guess, broad term would be quality of life. What, what we, you would normally consider to be someone's uh, current state, they're going along, and then something comes along to change that, and and then in turn has an impact on the community, right? Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Okay. Yeah. And in in kind of working on this and the scope of this, I guess that's kind of the question is, um, coming out of the pandemic, we've certainly heard a lot of different things. The community and and country as a whole have become aware of, like you say, mental health issues and those things. What's uh, been kind of the thinking that got us in the direction of saying we need a levy to do this? Yeah, well, we um, we were the beneficiary um, as as uh, were cities and and communities around the country of um, a lot of federal funds. Um, we received funds through both the CARES Act, which was the first round of coronavirus relief funds, um, as well as um, ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, and um, those funds were really um, uh, designed to help communities um, through the impacts of the pandemic. Unfortunately, those impacts have um, have not lapsed. Those impacts have not let up, um, particularly on the mental health side of things and on the homelessness side of things. Um, but um, the funding is drying up. Um, so we have the opportunity um, as a community to establish a long-term funding source um, through this um, through this levy. Um, so. Uh, we received and, and deployed um, a, a large amount of federal funds um, for um, really innovative programs that, during the pandemic, um, and um, we have other programs that are that are grant funded or have other you know soft funding, um, and uh, this is an opportunity for the community to articulate that these programs um, are a priority um, and to establish a long-term funding source. Because that's a problem. Anything and, and even pre-pandemic. I mean, if you go back 15, 20 years or more you'll see programs come along. Communities will try a program and they'll say, well, we could do this, or we could do that. I, I think, for example, of emergency services, classic example of this, communities like Missoula would say, we need to have emergency medical services. 
and they could find some grant funding and keep it running for the first year or two, but then you need equipment and you need uh, demands, and then trying to find that long source of funding. So a lot of times they would pass EMS levies, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea here is to come up with something. You mentioned soft funding. Maybe we should talk a little bit about What's the difference between that and an ongoing source of funding through the levy? Yeah, you know, so our, um, our, our police department, our fire department, um, a lot of our core city programs are funded through, um, through the general fund or through some tax assessment. Um, and so, um, and there's, there's limitations to those funding sources. We can't just go and, and raise general fund taxes um, to, um, to fund these programs. Um, we have a cap at the state level um, that is, uh, actually it's one half the rate of inflation. Um, and so, um, you know, in programs, the cost of programs increase at the cost of inflation. And so we're increasingly having to go to the voters to look for um, funding sources um, when, um, when we have programs that have community value. Um, other programs are funded with, um, you know, when I say soft funding, I oftentimes mean, you know, maybe there's a grant source uh, mm -hmm. or a grant, uh, you know, and maybe we get the same grant over and over again, but, um, but what happens if we don't? Um, and, uh, because frequently those are federal grants mm -hmm. passed through the state, mm -hmm. so there's several layers before the check actually arrives to yeah. help pay for a program, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the, the goal with the, crisis, with the levy is to establish um, a funding source. It's 20 mills, which is um, up to about $5 million a year. Um, and um, there's, um, there's some programs that are eligible um, that um, are in existence today, and the language is also written in a way where um, future programs, future uh, need might arise, um, and so the levy is flexible, um, gives, and it gives authority to the Board of County Commissioners and the City Council and, and, um, uh, to, to budget those funds. Um, Let's talk a little bit about that relationship, because I know people... Sometimes they'll look at something and, and un help us to understand the relationship and, and uh, you know, the county and the city both working on this issue through this levy proposal. Yeah. Well, the county is a great partner, and, and we've, got, we've got a number of county, um, county uh, staff in the audience today. Um, and the, the county commissioners and the, and the county staff have been a, f a phenomenal partner, um, uh, particularly in the, last, in the last few years around our Operation Shelter programs. Um, so these are programs that um, that are um, really pulled under one sort of um, cohesive umbrella, the Operation Shelter umbrella. And now there's there's programs that the county man the county manages. There's programs that the city manages. Um, there's programs that that uh, nonprofit partners manage. Um, but the intent of that Operation Shelter umbrella is to coordinate and collaborate. Um, and um, and the city and county share funding. We jointly fund. Um, uh, a lot of the programs under that umbrella, um, and that's a testament of that collaboration. Talk to me a little, too, about funding, because I know in a lot of cases, and this is kind of a broad observation, but when a community steps forward and has that dedicated source of funding, it could be for bridges and roads and streets or infrastructure, could be for any number of things, but when you have that funding, then that can make your case to go get additional uh, grant dollars or programs or those kinds of things. Is there some feeling that having a secure source here might also assist us to meet maybe some of those future demands as well? Yeah, you know, we see that a lot, particularly in our open space program. Um, and so our, our open space program um, uh, is really successful at getting grants um, from the State uh, Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, um, from, um, from other sources, um, uh, particularly for forest management and stewardship uh, uses. Uh, those, those grant funding sources typically require matching funds. Um, and so source of matching funds. Uh, we see that with transportation infrastructure as well. Um, you know, a lot of federal transportation infrastructure grants require, uh, it's very specific, it's 13.42% uh, match typically, but it's, um, but without those matching funds locally, you're not, a, you're not eligible to receive the grant. Yeah. Um, and so anytime we have a firm funding source, um, it, it does um, help us in our ability to, to seek grant funding. Well, let's do a little snapshot for a second and take this, uh, and, and again, if people have questions or comments, 552-6002 is the number to call uh, with those questions. Um, but let's, let's try to break this down into a little bit of a snapshot. Can you give us a, just sort of a, two or three thumbnail sketches of the type of person that might be helped by this directly? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's, let's, start, um, let's start with our homeless um, our houseless initiatives that are that are covered in this. Um, there, um, and I want to I want to start with the temporary safe outdoor space. Mm -hmm. That's a county initiative um, that's supported by the city. Um, it's currently located out on um, Highway 93 by the Bitterroot River, uh, but it's moving um, to to West Broadway. Um, 
That program has um, helped um, a, a number of individuals uh, find permanent housing. Um, so um, that is a you know kind of a safe place to stay. There there uh, there were there's wall tents out at the current site. Uh, there's more um, permanent uh, um, hard sided structures um, uh, made um, by a company called Pallet uh, called Pallet Structures, um, and those are you know they're simple modest um, one room structures um, that um, individuals at the TSOS can stay, um, and they are. Uh, and, but the, the, the secret to the TSOS is that it is um, a, an area where there's a wraparound of, of other services. So there's, there's, a, there's a safe, warm place to stay, um, and there's, um, there's um, facilities um, that uh, you know, provide for uh, the physical safety of the, of the residents. Um, but there's also um, this wraparound um, social support network. Um, so um, individuals can, you know, they can avail themselves of a social worker, or they can, they can get services to, you know, to maybe um, help them get an ID or help them um, help them um, in their journey to being housed. Um, and what we found at the TSOS was that uh, uh, about 45, 46%, a full 46% of people staying at the TSOS um, found permanent housing. Um, they didn't do that through housing subsidy. Um, they did that by getting access to a little bit of help um, and and repairing relationships with with people in their lives. Um, so maybe they're able that to. Seems like, that seems like a remarkable number. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've covered homeless uh, and houseless issues for years, but forty six percent is a pretty good tra uh, transition rate there. Yeah, you know, and I think it's it's really hard to access services and to avail yourself of services if you don't have your basic needs met. And that's really what that um, what that TSOS demonstrates is that if we if we provide for the basic needs and we um, we pull together with a supportive environment, uh, there's a lot we can do. So those that 46% um, is I think that's um, that's a, um, that's a group that that's a success story that we um, want to be able to continue. Um, so that's one that's one um, that's one area. Um, I'd actually love to go to some of our um, some of our. Um, partners in the audience for, um, for sure. profiles of, of their areas, and yeah. you know maybe we could maybe we could start with um, Chantel Gainer um, and uh, Chantel. Oh, Chantel, um, Chantel, why don't you come up uh, here for me, and uh, that way we can I think we can yeah no right here is fine that way we be on we can have you talk so and Chantel give us uh, go ahead and step just a little before we get you in the light here so go ahead and give us uh, your title and explain your program. Sure. My name is Chantel Gaynor. I'm the director of Missoula County's Community Justice Department. And we oversee a number of programs, including the Crime Victim Advocate Program, and we partner with others in the justice system, such as our courts, our prosecutors, and uh, Sheriff's Department and law enforcement on the city side to stand up additional programs, one of which is the Community Supported Release Program. We brought in grant funds and the technical assistance and the sheriff's department did the legwork to actually make it happen. So sometimes we serve as a partner and sometimes we serve as the program delivery people. Let's talk about a little bit like the mayor was saying. So let's visualize somebody that is in kind of a transitional, especially it could be housing, could be a number of things. How does the how does your program then assist them to to sort of get squared away? Certainly. It almost always starts with asking people what they need first. And the person walking through the door has a variety of needs. So a crime victim advocate their primary need might be their immediate safety. So first things first, do we need to help you change a lock? Do we need to help you repair a window? Then what do you need in terms of something on paper? Maybe you need an order of protection. We can help you fill out that paperwork. We can help you apply for it. A lot of folks going through that, it's advocates are kind of like the first time you need a, a specialty doctor. You don't know you need them until you need them and you don't know what to expect. So they do a lot of setting expectations, telling you what the process is gonna look like really lowering your anxiety so that you can go through the process and make the best decisions for yourself. And for us, it's about empowering that person and getting them back on their feet and off to their lives again. Now, I would imagine, um, you know, we say it off of uh, homelessness, houselessness situations, but I know for a fact that in terms of especially domestic violence cases, there's all kinds of things where the safety becomes that issue in, in trying to get them back into a more stable situation. How's your program help? Certainly, there's a number of steps that we can take. Oftentimes we start with safety planning. So a person in a domestic violence situation, they're the expert. They know what to, they've seen patterns before, they've lived with this person. So sometimes it might be helping them move. Sometimes it might be helping them move out of state. Um, it might be figuring out what to do with their kids. Maybe they need supervised visitation. So these are all the things that we would just walk through them, help identify, and then advocates are specially trained to, to identify things that would look like high lethality situations and reflect that back. 
But we also have partners in law enforcement who also do lethality assessments. So sometimes a referral will come that way. Um, re and really with domestic violence, the folks who never called for services are really the folks who are, are more at risk. And so in those cases, it's getting our message out and letting folks know that services are available, they're confidential, and they're free. And, and that last part is what's important because really the program, is, it's free to, the, to those folks, but it's not free to run, right? It's not free to run. One of the things I will point out with all of these initiatives, we can pay a little now or a lot later. And domestic violence is, a, is one of those cases where a misdemeanor, partner, family member assault, domestic violence situation, can turn into a homicide. That is tragic. It tears apart families. And for our community, it's horrifically expensive, from the investigation to the prosecution to somebody being in prison. But again, the untold trauma in people's lives has generational impacts. So we can invest a little and have huge impacts on intervention and prevention that makes a difference, or we can not do things and deal with much bigger consequences down the road. Well put. Chantel, thank you so thank much. You. That's sure. a good depiction of that, too. So, Mayor, go ahead. Uh, well, and, I, and I think um, Chantel has uh, members of her team here as well, um, and um, and it's such a broad, um, uh, such a broad mission and such an important mission, and it, and it goes, it shows the um, the diversity of, of needs in the community and the diversity of, of programs that could be funded um, through through the levy. Um, we have um, we have um, some folks from our crisis intervention um, team here as well. Um, we have Officer Jay Gilhouse um, and. Um, and Teresa Williams here, and um, and they bring a really different um, uh, uh, perspective. This. Perspective, because and, it really and, is. Before and, we go to him, because mm -hmm. that really is one thing that communities deal with. You know, you always there's always this question: at what point does you know fire? You always talk about this. You know, do you prevent fire or fight fire? Right, and and fire prevention is is a much better way to go. It not only saves lives, it saves money and everything else, but you also have to fight the fires too at the same time, I suppose. So that is interesting. So where are they at here? So we've got Officer oh, Gilhouse let's here. Take, let, yeah, yeah, Officer Gilhouse, come on. We'll get you right here first, and then <laughs> we'll go from there. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about, go ahead and step forward just so we get a little light on here. So we talk about the crisis intervention uh, type approach to things. How has that really impacted and informed what law enforcement does uh, here in 2022? It's been a huge impact on how we do our jobs. When I started this job 14 years ago, I, the police were the last line, and we were called to a problem. We were expected to fix it, and we had to get creative sometimes in how we did that within how the law is written and guides us on our way. That doesn't always take account the person who is actually in crisis and what their best needs are. Uh, now, with these services available to us, when we are coming across somebody in crisis, a lot of them are frequent contacts in the, in the emergency services. We are able to get to know that individual, find out what exactly their crisis entails and how to curtail a plan to try to get that person and try to minimize their uh, contacts with law enforcement so that it frees us up to be able to uh, respond to those actual emergencies in progress. Because I know when you when when you guys respond to stuff, oftentimes I don't know what the percentage is, but I would say crisis tends to be without a doubt the the most prominent uh, quotient that you see. It is, yeah, very frequent. I don't have a percentage either, but it is the majority of our contacts is a person who is experiencing a level of crisis. Uh, people aren't calling nine one one for the police because they're having a good day. It's something that we need to address and help that individual, help that family. Uh, get out and with this we now have resources that can take it further than the police can. I can't get involved in medical, I can't communicate with doctors, I can't talk about further care. Uh, that's not within the scope of my job or training or abilities, but I can make those connections with those bigger communities to make those types of connections and hopefully help this person out in the long run. How's that, how's that feel to you and, and to your colleagues as, as officers? Because I know you want to help people out, and that's really why you get in the job that you have. That's why you wear that badge. Oh, absolutely. Knowing that there is a resource out there that I can pass something off on, which typically we are, we are investigating crimes and determining whether or not somebody needs to go to jail and then figuring out how to make a situation safe. Uh, now we can pass that on so that we can take it a little bit further to address these further issues and get people into a better place and provide them with some help. And that keeps our officers safe too. I mean, I I can I could tell you stories, you know, <laughs> go on about situations where we had mental health be at the heart of officer-involved shootings and just some terrible community tragedies I've seen over the years. 
simply because of that. There was, you know, as soon as you hear that call, you know, we've been here before. And so to be able to resolve that and push and move the community forward must be. Absolutely. And it helps our relations with the community as well. And people treat us differently. And it helps, they get to know that we are out there to help them and we connect them with these further resources. And it's more than just the person that's possibly going to take me to jail or take my family member to jail or anything like that. We are the a resource out there who are on the ground having connections with these people who are in crisis and making that connection to the next level yeah. of care. Very, very informed activity there. So, officer, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, who else do we have here? Okay, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, why don't you yeah, come on over right here and be, yeah, else. go ahead and stand right about here. So, Hi. yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself. Teresa Williams, CIT program manager, and CIT stands for Crisis Intervention Team. And what I want to highlight on, on Officer Gilhouse's uniform is the CIT Montana pin. Yeah, I noticed. And so Officer Gilhouse and our mobile support team members, firefighters, um, folks that are within our service provider community, they do attend a 40-hour CIT academy, which really emphasizes um, de-escalation techniques, those um, resources to help ensure that um, when officers do encounter someone, they are taking the time to slow down, they're um, listening, and they are really trying to increase connections to the mobile support team, um, to mental health, and with the ultimate goal of how do we improve outcomes for people that are experiencing a behavioral health crisis. And so we really want um, this pin to really embody that if you're in crisis and you see this on an officer, or even on a mobile support team clinician or EMT or firefighter, you know that they have that training, they have that awareness, and they have that aptitude to take the time and support you. And the, and the whole idea, it really keeps everybody safe. It, it, it could be that person in crisis, the officers or the firefighters responding, the neighbors. I mean, there's, there's, it's quite a concentric circles that come out. It absolutely is. And I think the important piece about CIT being a community team is that we're uh, really trying to pay attention to the response on the ground, but we're also zooming out and trying to figure out at the partnership level and the community level, how do we um, improve our crisis response system? And we do that really well with our NAMI partners, National Alliance on Mental Illness. They're also here represented in the room and our advocacy partners and our mental health partners. So for Officer Gilhouse being a CIT trained officer, if it's 10 o'clock at night, mobile support team is off and, and they're not a resource, um, it's really important that we do have these trained officers um, there to support folks. And also another connection um, that's not jail, that's not the hospital, or maybe it's with family, but we need to ensure that our system is able to help folks through the entire continuum. Yeah, because it, it really, it, there's the aspect of being on the street and that initial response, that initial call, but then what happens the next day or the next 48 hours or the next two weeks or month or whatever. Exactly. That continuum is so important. And again, we call that the three-legged stool, um, moving everything together with policies, procedures, um, involving people with lived experience in our training academy and with our NAMI partners, um, but really looking at that community level intervention as well. Now, I would imagine the levy, so it sounds like this would take a tremendous amount of tracking, though, too, at the same time, because that's been kind of the problem in, in years past. Uh, we have that initial response, something's going on, and then it's like, I'm not sure what happened. I know I passed it up the system. Uh, but then I'm back out there on another call. And, and so what's the tracking aspect of this, and how would the levy funds help with that? So we do have a data analyst that is working on that very aspect and helping us pull together the crisis response system data. So we are starting to make headway on that. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a gap right now, and that's what we're trying to, to meet in our community. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Appreciate it very much. It is an interesting program, Jordan, that... Uh, um, you know, I, I, I think of <laughs> so many things have happened during this, uh, you know, during the last two, almost three years now of, of change and stuff. And I know this response team was something that uh, the, the council really felt strongly about, right? That this was a different way to approach some of these issues that had come up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think um, it was a recognition that, um, that training is a tool, but also um, our mobile support team um, is another example of, um, of um, uh, responding with the right type of, of tool. Um, mm -hmm. So um, if someone's in crisis um, and our mobile response team, um, our, our mobile support team rather shows up, um, they um, have a different, a different type of training and different credentials uh, that allow them to, to deal with um, a, an individual um, who's experiencing a crisis to, to, to serve that person in a different way. 
And it's really a case of bringing that expertise on scene, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. they still are going to use the other officers or the other firefighters or whoever else those responders are. But now you've got somebody that's a, a specialist, if you will, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as this goes along, one question that's come up uh, as I've been thinking about these different programs, how do we, how do we establish, um, again, the priorities going into the levy? You talked about having permanent funding. Uh, you know, things change. Programs change. Needs change. What's that process sort of look like in terms of how do we start, how do we prioritize, and then what do we do long term? Yeah, so, you know, if the levy passes, um, there will be um, a process at the, at the county level um, and um, uh, through their budgeting process and a process at the city level at the, through our budgeting process. Um, I um, just, uh, um, because of the strength of that partnership, um, I trust that that process will be very collaborative between both jurisdictions. Um, the city and county will establish um, like an, an interlocal agreement that basically um, says, okay, you're going to fund this and we'll fund this, and, okay. and this is the split, and this is... Um, Which is similar to what you do in, in planning and all kinds yeah. of other... Possible. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's actually very similar to what we do with an open space bond. Um, mm -hmm. The open space bond doesn't say, okay, you're going to buy um, these 40 acres on the North Hills um, when, when you go to the voters. It says, um, do you generally approve of um, this type of program and, this, and authorize the Board of County Committee Commissioners and the city and the city of Missoula to, right. to do XYZ. Um, so the levy is very similar, where where there's authorizing language um, and it's broadly um, around programs. Um, these are examples of, of the types of programs that can be funded through that levy. Um, but um, the process of actually allocating those funds will go through the um, the city and county budgeting process. And of course, those are you know those are big long. Um, public and in, public involvement processes um, so the community will have the opportunity to, to, to weigh in on um, on programs what programs are um, are important to them um, and, and so on and so, so there's forth. room in the system to adjust and adapt and add to take away um, depending on what those needs would mm -hmm. be going forward right? and we don't know in a decade what the needs will be yeah um, and so that's that flexibility is really important which, which one other technical question, what is the length of this levy? Is this an ongoing package? Do you have to go back for reauthorization? How is that mechanically going to work? This, this is structured as an ongoing uh, levy. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I thought. Yeah. All right, good. Yeah. Uh, we are here Wednesdays with the mayor uh, here at the uh, Missoula Public Library. Thank everybody for coming uh, and, and for watching uh, with our team. Joel Baird and his team from MCAT always do a wonderful job of uh, getting us out there in the streaming space. And, of course, this uh, recordings of this will be available at at a later date as well, so those are online uh, with the uh, MCAT team. Um, also, if you have questions, 552-6002 is the number to call, 552-6002, and we'll get to some of those questions. Um, one thing we touched on uh, a little bit, and maybe we have some other experts to deal with this a little further, uh, transition. So, so from a mental health standpoint, recognizing that mental health can be, you know, pop up in, in all of these areas at one point or another, but specifically, you mentioned early on, uh, suicidal situations where we're really concerned about that or a substance abuse or those things. Um, is there anybody else that can kind of explain a little bit about maybe that aspect of things and the mental health specifically? Yeah, you know, and, and these programs, there's, there's several that are relevant. So we have, we have John Petroff here from our mobile support team. We also have um, Terry Kendrick here from Partnership Health um, Center. And um, uh, Terry's leading an effort to establish what's called a crisis receiving center. Um, so a crisis receiving center is a, a place where um, individuals who are um, who are experiencing crisis will be able to to drop in and um, have their um, their um, mental health crisis stabilized, um, receive evaluations uh, of of their um, of their condition and. Um, uh, it's it's designed as a short term. Um, it's uh, 23 uh, 23 hour and 59 minute uh, you know short term. It's a place um, where um, uh, the police could um, could take someone in need of services. It's a place where someone could um, could um, go on their own accord mm -hmm. and and avail themselves of services. Um, and it's really. Um, um, it's really an alternative to right now. The only thing we have um, for people experiencing those types of crisis is um, the emergency department at the hospital or or the jail. Yeah. And and if you're experiencing a mental health crisis, you don't need to go to jail. You, right. you need to um, receive access to to some services. And of course, um, because the way the law is that something has to be done. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes they end up. Yeah, it's either jail or ER mm -hmm. or this then this. And and there's really very little option for those. Uh, where's Terry at? Is Terry? Here somewhere. Oh, Terry, come on up and go. Yeah, come on through here. 
Come on, Terry. Well, let's stand right over here so we can be on, on the camera here because I would like to have you kind of explain a little bit more. Go ahead and stand right about there. So, Terry, tell me about that that aspect of things of what this kind of facility the mayor described. How how would that service in the community and how, how would that kind of function? Well, uh, Mayor Hess did a great job of describing it, but, you know, one of the things we know is if a person is in crisis that they often need maybe someone to call, so a crisis line, or they'll call 911, and now the community has 988, so um, that's a person to call, and then someone to respond, and that may be the mobile support team, it might be other first responders, and then often those situations can be de-escalated and the person is okay where they are, but if they're not, then they need a place to go. And so the crisis receiving center would be a place where they could go if they're having a mental health crisis or if they're under the influence of a substance or and or um, as long as they're not in a medically critical state and it will be staffed by um, nurses um, social workers some peer support so folks will be able to be uh, have an assessment also have their sort of what would I say, um, some medical needs met, like if they have a wound that needs to be cleaned and bandaged, and then they can get some rest. Often that's what folks need is just some quiet time to de-escalate. And then there'll be people to say, okay, what is your, um, you know, what's a goal that you'd like to do? You know, how can we help make your life better? And then hook folks up with resources. And, you know, that's sort of where the continuum also needs to go is we need more substance use treatment available in the community and as we all know more um, housing for folks and wraparound services but at least they would have a place to go to be able to start that process it, sa it sounds like that's much different than we've you know done historically because i know that's a problem for a lot of people they they'll get into a confinement situation uh not to you know disparage our er's or our jails or whatever but basically people coming out of that are like I don't know what I was doing there. I hear this all the time, or I hear this, unfortunately, in court trials a lot of times where they, you know, it's escalated beyond that. So the idea would be assessment, um, some assistance, those kinds of things, and then what happens next after they've been there. Right? right, right. And that our job would be to try to also follow up to make sure that they had a warm or hot handoff to those next resources to really connect them in the community. But you're exactly right. You know, folks go to the emergency department or Maybe they're trespassing and they end up in jail, but it's really because there is no other place for them to go. And so this will, you know, serve that purpose in the community. But now to be clear, so this is a, this center is not operating now. This is something we'd need the levy to be able to do. Am I right? Right. And the, I have a, a drawing of the architectural plan. So it's in the works and really we do feel it will be hopefully up and operational by next um, next summer. Wow, that's great. So this the whole idea with this concept, are we breaking new ground here? Is this something we've seen other communities do and we're sort of adapting? Uh, what, what's the, how's this model been used? This model has been used in other areas in the country. Um, Teresa Williams from CIT knows a lot about crisis receiving centers and there's also longer term crisis stabilization that will have folks for 72 hours. But there is a crisis receiving center in Billings. They've been operating for about 17 years. That's the only one in the state. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You. All right. So there's another idea of how these partners come together. And, and Mayor, when, when we talk about this aspect of things, is, is, is the feeling that the levy is a, is a more um, direct way to approach these problems now rather than piecemeal and try to put these together, say, over the next five to ten years or just what yeah I mean I think the levy is an acknowledgement that we have um, we have a lot of challenges that are related um, mm -hmm. and the levy allows us to um, to do you know particularly it allows us to do some long-term planning so in the in the area of our services for um, individuals in our community experiencing homelessness we have um, you know we, we open a winter shelter um, and then um, at the end of the winter, we close the winter shelter, and then you know we open something else, and then and then we transition to the winter shelter, and we're we're piecing together these these funding sources, um, and um, and we don't have long-term funding. You know, we we have this this um, coronavirus relief funding, and we don't have the ability to, um, as it stands right now, to stand up a long-term program. Um, 
So one of the things that I would look, look forward to should the levy pass is that we will have the opportunity to do this long range planning um, and to, um, to develop programs knowing that there's a stable funding source. So maybe rather than transitioning from an emergency winter shelter to an authorized campsite, maybe we um, develop some sort of um, year round um, lower barrier um, shelter option. Um, we don't just need emergency shelters in the winter anymore. We've got, we've got increasing periods of heat and smoke um, and um, we um, have other conditions that, that um, folks in our community need to find respite from. Um, so um, that's one of the best things, I think, is that it allows us to, um, to really um, prioritize in a long-term way. Great. So we're talking about the crisis services levy uh, this evening as uh, we talk with Mayor Jordan Hess and some of the other staffers who are here. We uh, got our students in. Welcome to all of you. Uh, they like to come in and hear what's going on and oftentimes have some of our best questions, too. So we appreciate you all being here. Um, Let's let's touch on one aspect of this, uh, then, Mayor. When we talk about because the, the big, the big, I'll play devil's advocate for a minute because a lot of people are really looking at this and saying uh, these are great. You know, these programs are great. We love this. It's a solution, but I just can't afford it anymore. And um, th this is always this ongoing debate. It's not just about this levy. But tell me philosophically, how do you feel about the community investing in this type of thing, and what does it mean to everybody broadly mm -hmm. in Missoula? Yeah. So I mean, first of all. What we're doing now is expensive too, um, or what we were doing before we had these programs was expensive. Um, so um, sending someone to jail is $125 a night um, to, to house someone in the jail where they don't have, uh, where that's not necessarily where they need to be. Um, the emergency, uh, the emergency departments at both of our hospitals have um, have all this uncompensated care um, that um, could have been diverted. Um, and so I think um, one of the things that's, that's really um, compelling to me about the, this suite of services is that um, we, can, um, we can do well and do good. I mean, we can, we can do right by our community, and we can also, um, it also can make, make sense financially. Um, and um, that's, uh, that's um, one of the things that's most compelling to me is that um, it, it, this, the services in this, um, in this levy really speak to, to our values as a community. We have said over and over and over again as a community that we care about one another. We, we show up um, and support one another. That we, and we, um, we reiterate this collective commitment to community that we have made um, time and time again as Missoulians. Um, and that's, that's a values-based statement. Um, we can also say these services actually save us money, um, and um, they um, they help us be the community we want to be, um, and they also um, save money in in um, in other areas. Is is there a feeling too with Missoula growth, um, and, and we're just seeing the start of it? You can feel it right now. Um, is there a feeling that this is a way that we maybe need to get ahead of this problem right now, uh, before we add another twenty five thousand people, and all of a sudden we have an even larger uh, set of issues? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And and um, but you know, communities of all sizes are are feeling these issues. Um, mm -hmm. uh, particularly, I mean, there's a huge issue um, with with um, mental health in rural communities. It's and and so um, it's not confined to cities. Um, I think our issues change as we grow, um, but we'll have. We'll have challenges um, that we can that we'll need to navigate either way, um, but um, um, you know the adage about about um, about prevention. I mean, we work in the preventative in work preventing crises um, will pay dividends in the long run. We're uh, just past our halfway point, and that's usually where we start to open it up for questions. Uh, so uh, we're talking about the crisis uh, services levy, which covers a lot of territory. I mean, we 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 you know we talked about homelessness, houselessness. We've talked about mental health, suicide, law enforcement, uh, all those things, um, and uh, and especially getting care for these folks, and then all the way down to crime victims and courts. Uh, so anybody have any questions or anything like that you're curious about uh, that we can uh, either ask uh, Mayor Hess or uh, any of the experts in the audience? So who else do we have, too, from a staff standpoint? Is there any aspect of this I've missed that you had anybody else, yeah, any of the other you, experts that could explain things? You know, there's um, on, on the criminal justice side, um, there's some interesting work going on on um, – uh, jail diversion programs, um, and um, the com the community supported reentry program is a program run through the Missoula County uh, through the sheriff's office, um, and that's a um, that's a, a jail diversion program that is uh, is really unique. Um, Kim White is here to um, tell oh, us yeah. a little bit about that program. Where's Kim? I saw earlier. Oh, there we are, Kim. Come on, we had more people come in, and I it's hard to see. So come on over here, Kim. We'll be on the camera here. Yeah, let's talk about this diversion program because you know, these are things that have been 
growing and adapting tremendously over the past 10, 15 years. It, 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 watching how the concept of diversion and then community reentry. Tell us a little bit about what, what are we doing here in Missoula and, and how would these funds help? Well, with the sheriff's office, one of the things that we did was we recognized that there was a need to kind of service some of the folks that were the high frequency users of the jail services. And so we developed a program that looks at the individuals that are, like I said, the high frequency users. And we work in getting them out of custody and hooked up with services in the community so that we can meet their needs once they're identified to include mental health issues, uh, substance abuse issues. We work with individuals with respect to homeless crises and we ensure that they, we work with them to stay out of custody and to make their jail, or excuse me, rather court appearances and maintain law abiding behavior while they're in the community going through the court process. So we work with a wide variety of individuals, but it does help to reduce the number of individuals in the jail. And then, like I said, we have so many supportive services in the community. Missoula is ripe with that. And it does assist with getting their needs met while they're going through the court process. And I know that the, the objective there really is to find and locate. Certainly not everybody, you know, is, is ready to, to move on or, or change their lives. But it's trying to find those people who really all they need are those breadcrumbs, if you will, to be able to follow and and, uh, and make changes, right? Oh, absolutely. And they do get an intensive case management type of service through the folks that work in the program. And we found some success in finding individuals, ways to navigate the system. And for some, it's just as, as minor as getting an identification card, because it is an obstacle for a lot of our folks. And we've been able to work with partners and find areas that we can be resourceful and, and innovative. And it's, it, like I said, we've, we've really taken this program and serviced several individuals that would have been in custody while they were going through the process. Almost sounds like, though, it, when I think about jail diversion programs, a lot of these started, you know, 30 plus years ago. Initially, it was just that, okay, you're going out on a work release thing or something like that. This sounds like because of this web of support, uh, these, these types of efforts have really advanced pretty dramatic. Oh, for sure. And I think one of the things that has been said, and it needs to be reiterated, is that when you talk about the crisis levy, there's really a continuum of care that's provided with a lot of the um, services that would be funded through this crisis levy. It's so important to be able to work collaboratively with our partners that I work on a regular basis with Ray Riser from the Calibrate program and with Teresa Williams from CIT. And, and we work a lot of times servicing the same individuals, but it's that continuum of care to ensure that those warm handoffs are done and we are just not taking an individual to a, a level and then they're left in the same um, place as they came to us because they don't have that person to, to take that breadcrumb, so to speak, approach. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate that explanation. It is fascinating, Mayor, to, to see um, the, the, the repetitive uh, situation a lot of people find themselves in. It, it, you know, it, the, old ad, the old expression is a vicious circle, but it really can be for some folks, can it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. As, as you look at this, too, uh, any other questions? Want to check? Okay, good. Got an attentive audience, but they're, <laughs> they're uh, still processing what we've been talking about. Um, when you look at this, uh, then, um, is there any thought, and again, from a devil's advocate standpoint, I have to ask these questions, too. Somebody may look at this and say, well, if you have all these great programs to serve all these people with various issues, that means Missoula is just going to attract more of those people. So if I'm up in, you know, in a neighboring county, say I'm up in the Bitterroot or something, and I hear, oh, they can get me a house, or they can get me this or that. Is there any fear that this would be just a magnet to, uh, you know, draw more people in from outside Missoula and outside Missoula County to come and, you know, ask, access these services? You know, that's the thing we hear anecdotally. There's, there's really no evidence to substantiate that. Um, our coordinated entry system is a, a system um, that uh, is um, a, a way that people can avail themselves of services for, um, uh, for home, if they're experiencing homelessness. Um, and one of the questions that we ask in that process is what their last residential address was. And um, I, I believe it's about 70% um, who have had their previous residential address in the state of Montana. Um, you know, I think if you look at our community, um, so many of us are transplants from, from other places. I think that that's probably a greater proportion um, 
than our community at, at, whole, at, at large. Yeah. Um, so it's really, um, we don't see any evidence that people are coming here for the services. Um, it's just, um, it's just something that, that we hear, but, but there's nothing to substantiate it. Okay. Because uh, I know a lot of people say that, you know, that's one of the arguments is you provide more services than in theory, more people come and then the, you need more services, you need more money. And you know, it starts a, starts that type of situation. If the levy uh, is approved here on election day, uh, what's kind of the timing of that money kicking in and, and when will these funds start to be available then? How, how would that sort of work? Does anybody know that? I don't know that. I bet our um, our county um, chief administrative officer um, is in the, is in the background. Um, Ann, um, Ann Hughes, our um, <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Ann, do you, um, the What's question the is what is the timeline for if the levy is approved? Um, when uh, when would funds? Um, uh, yeah, this is a quick in? question. This is an easy one, Ann. I don't want to get in trouble with you. So yeah, just from a timing standpoint, what's that? What's that term? Well, first of all, I don't want to give myself a promotion. I am not the chief administrative <laughs> officer for Missoula County. He was here just a minute ago, yeah. but he, um, I'm the chief operating officer for Missoula County. And the timeline would be uh, if the voters were to approve this in November, then we would be looking at uh, our fiscal year 24 budgets, right? So those taxes would then be levied in the following fiscal year. Okay, good. Thank you, Ann. Yeah, Sorry to put you on the spot. I thought that was the case, but I want to be sure. So with that in mind, uh, to keep things running in the meantime, do we have uh, access to ARPA funds and, and those kinds of sources to tide us over until yeah. this goes in? So we've developed, the city and county have both developed um, their budgets for, um, for we're in fiscal year 2023. So it's, it's a little, um, it doesn't run with the calendar year. It's a right. little, little goofy. But it, um, fiscal year 2023 starts in July of 2022 and runs through June of 23. So we're, we're budgeted through um, the end of this fiscal year and then that following fiscal year 2024 um, starts next July and that's, what, that's when the funds would, would become available. Okay, good. Um, so talking about this crisis services levy, th this uh, obviously simple majority on this, right? I always get That's a little correct. confused because yep. some some states require that super majority, but mm -hmm. Montana's not one of them. So so basically a 50% yep. sort of thing. What's kind of the, been the, the some of the questions maybe that you've run into as, as you've been out and about uh, over the past month or so since this was proposed uh, that you'd like to address? I think the biggest thing is that um, this is, um, I you know, there, there are um, very critical, and, you know, important services, life-saving services that are, um, that are geared toward um, individuals experiencing homelessness, um, but it's so much more than that. Um, there are uh, well over a dozen programs that are examples of programs that can be funded, um, and, and really only three of them are um, directly serving individuals experiencing homelessness. So I think if I could cl clarify any misconception, it is that um, this is more broadly focused on individuals in our community experiencing crisis. Um, and um, I think that's a message that um, we need to continue to get out to the voters over the next couple of weeks. And, and the concept is, is that not anybody, you know, anybody can go into crisis at any time, right? Mm -hmm. This is a volatile situation. This, even though there are people that may fit certain categories or have ongoing issues, anybody can have a, you know, an employment situation, a health thing, or a, a mental situation come up at almost yeah. any time, right? Absolutely. So there's some feeling that that would then help help uh, almost anybody. It's a safety net, if you will, for out there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. What's been your reaction to from from parents who may you mentioned earlier, and I thought that was a, that was a very salient point where you talked about um, you know the, the the parent who's dealing with suicidal teens mm -hmm. because that's a huge issue right now uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, how do you feel? What, what's been your interaction with maybe parents, and and what mm -hmm. would you like to say to them uh, since we're trying to plan for future services and future generations? Yeah. You know, I think it goes back to that community values discussion again, where we are just a community that has reiterated this collective commitment to, to one another over and over again. And that, I think, is um, a message that, um, that I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the strengths of our community, um, and it's a message that resonates with parents, uh, but it's a, it's a message that resonates throughout our community. Um, and um, the, um, the reality is that these issues can affect anyone and and can affect um, you know our friends and loved ones they can affect our neighbors um, and um, and so uh, whether you're a parent or not um, you, you know you you may be at the receiving end of, of some of these services um, the mobile support team is um, is a particular example of um, a team that serves a diversity of, of, of populations um, it, it does serve um, a, a portion of our um, 
our houseless population. It also, um, but well over um, uh, nearly three quarters of the services that they provide are to um, individuals who have a home who are experiencing some form of crisis. Um, we have um, John Petroff from our mobile support team. Yeah, we hadn't talked to John. I would uh, like to yeah. ask him about that. John, come on up. <laughs> Because that is one thing that I think the demographics, how, how you doing? Good to good, see you good, again. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I want to talk about that because this is something that the mayor uh, touched on. And I, you know, having been on the scene of many, many different calls over the years, um, there's that stereotype that, that, oh, this is, you know, this type of situation, this is what happens. Tell us a little bit about that variety of folks that, that you guys have seen out there working. Yeah, I guess, um, so for, for the mobile support team, we, we see just about everything, everything, as Mayor has said, um, we see everything from depression to anxiety to suicidal ideations. Um, and really, for the mobile support team, we're looking at, like, that fourth response resource. We have law enforcement that responds to criminal stuff. We have fire that responds to fires and EMS. And then we have our ambulance service that responds to medical. Um, we really respond to any type of crisis. So it could be somebody that's having frequent falls in their home. It can be something like that that is, we're looking at the prevention part, part of that as well. Um, we respond to, we respond to children, we respond to adults, um, elderly, working with all of these um, people in the room actually. That's really like a big piece of this for us is like for our success to happen, we need all of these other services to be a part of it. Um, without these services, we cannot be successful in responding and then finding actual help to these to these individuals in crisis. I know having had a lot of friends in law enforcement and, and the fire services over the years, there's always historically there was this feeling of loneliness and frustration because you would get out there, you try to deal with this, you try to solve this situation. And like I say, it doesn't have to necessarily be a major crisis. Be, like you said, somebody that's falling or a child or something. But there's always this feeling of, frustration. I, I just wish I could solve this or I could help them. And how's it been to, to have the mobile response team to be able to have that that additional layer of, of direction and assistance for these folks? Yeah, I think for the for the initial response, it's it's great. It's it's another resource. It's another option for our law enforcement, fire and EMS to to have somebody show up that has no agenda when they arrive on scene. So we show up and we don't we don't have an answer right there. We're going to meet people where they're at. We're really going to work with them. And then, and that, again, that's where we work with our CIT partners. We work with, with pretrial. We work with all these, and we're communicating often to really find, find a resource that works for that individual. Um, so, so I think it's a relief as a firefighter myself for 17 years. It's a relief for me to know that there's something else out there. Um, when we respond as a firefighter, we want to solve the problem and move on. And that's because we have other other problems building up, yeah. So so we really we really are trying to take it a different approach as a response, and then connecting with resources and and building our network is really a piece of that. I would imagine that's really a healthy environment for ideas uh, to take place too, uh, innovation and and say, well, I've got what what if I knew somebody and we did this, right? Yeah, yeah, we definitely. Um, I've learned a lot in the last two years. We. I've been talking a lot about, like, we've been siloed for a lot of years, even if we didn't know we have been, um, both in other agencies in town as fire departments and police departments. Like, I feel like the community is really coming together in this crisis response and, and really building, building a team of people within our community that can actually help. Perfect. Good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great comments there because, yeah, the, the, you know, especially from the, you know, I, I've seen that so many times where it, it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard thing when you're that first responder and those first folks coming in and, yeah, not an easy job. So this is a way to support all that too, isn't it? I imagine you spent a lot of years uh, covering these things yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and being on scene as well. Yeah, yeah. You see, you see things, it's really interesting. Some of the, some of the circumstances, like I say, I, I can recall an officer involved shooting out in Washington where a mentally ill person um, and he had had uh, numerous situations uh, with law enforcement, prob probably every six or eight weeks they were down there and he lived in kind of an isolated area and, Sure enough, uh, one day they got a call to go down there, and it, that was the day he had a shotgun, and he shot a, a very beloved officer right there on his front porch, and led to about a, I was like a 23-hour standoff, and you know then the expensive trial that followed, and everything else. So yeah, I've I've, I've seen a few of these kind of situations. Um, what would you like the the undecided voter to know about this program? You know, I guess I would I would hope that voters go into this with um, with clarity about or with you know just with with um, I, I hope that they understand the the breadth the 
depth and breadth of programs that are um, eligible for funding under this levy. Um, I, um, there's, there's great information available on Missoula County's website, MissoulaCountyVoice.com um, has a, a page about this levy and has great information on, on um, types of programs, um, uh, tax impacts on, on, typical, on your typical house in Missoula or, or impact per, um, per $100,000. Um, it has, um, uh, it's a really good resource for individuals who are undecided um, mm -hmm. and I would encourage them to take the time to look at that and, um, and um, understand um, what's on the ballot. Um, it is a complicated um, suite of programs and, it, and, um, and so um, I think that would be, um, that would serve those voters well to take, take the time to do the research. Well, we certainly appreciate everyone coming tonight and being able to discuss different aspects of this. One, more, one last call, any questions from anybody? Any of the young people that are worried about uh, this, these kinds of issues? Now's your chance, yes. Go ahead and stand up. Yeah, give us your name. I'm Amy Boot, um, and I wanted to ask, uh, how many people do you anticipate will be, how many individuals in crisis will be helped by this levy in a way that they wouldn't otherwise be without the levy? That's a good question. Yeah, that's Fair. a great question. Um, I, I actually don't, I don't know. <laughs> I think, um, I think um, you know, each of these programs have had, have had impacts on, on uh, keep their own metrics and have impacts. Um, um, I, I don't know if I can answer that as far as how many people we could um, we could serve um, with or without the levy. Um, one thing I do know is that um, about 20% of our community will experience um, some form of a, a mental health crisis each year. Um, and so if we're reaching a portion of those, it gets to be a pretty significant number uh, pretty quickly. Good. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Maybe, um, maybe we could ask the CIT or something. Anybody got a stat here that sort of is a snapshot? Come on up. Can't help. Because, yeah, from, you definitely are keeping a track of case files and all those kind of things. What about that? Is there, give us maybe just a little snapshot of, of folks that might be impacted by this. Well, certainly. What I can say is the Crime Victim Advocate Program serves 1,800 people a year. So just there is just shy of 2,000. And law enforcement trained folks have their own cluster, the diversion folks. I would say easily 4,500 in a year. And as uh, Mayor Hess has said, with 20% of our population, you know, do the math, all of a sudden that looks north of 20,000 people. And the, these are the kind of problems too that can, can catch you real fast, can't they? Because we, you know, I think of what we've seen in schools with delayed learning issues with, uh, you know, the, the remote learning. A lot of these, you don't realize, it, it takes five, six, maybe more years before you start to realize we went through a period there and look at where we are. Right? Absolutely. Some of these issues will continue and for families who have generational issues and impacts, we'll see it, we'll see it today, we'll see it tomorrow. Being able to interrupt it and get folks into services is, is what breaks those, those links. Um, and so again, just visualizing 20,000 people fills up Washington Stadium. So that's how many folks in our community need help annually. And this is, this is a small investment in that. Thank you for clarifying that. Appreciate it very much. And, and Dennis, we have several other um, representatives from other um, city and county and, and partner uh, programs, and maybe we could um, provide the opportunity yeah, let's, for anyone else to introduce it, themselves. Anybody else want to introduce themselves and uh, jump in here with some explanation or some thoughts about that? Now's your chance <laughs> to explain how it affects your, uh, your situation or your program. So we must have covered it fairly well, I guess. So <laughs> we're in good shape there. Well, it is an interesting thing. And like you said, uh, give us that uh, the website address or where people can look up more information uh, to find that out again. So Missoula County has a, a website called Missoula County Voice, and it's um, MissoulaCountyVoice.com. Um, and it's, um, it's um, uh, a, a website that has all sorts of Missoula County related issues. But there's a, there's, um, a page for the levy on that, uh, on that website. Um, we've previously plugged EngageMissoula.com. That's the city of Missoula's version of that. Um, uh, and that's a good resource as well for some of these programs. Um, uh, particularly, um, our, our um, uh, Operation Shelter Initiatives have mm -hmm. great information on EngageMissoula.com um, and levy specific information at MissoulaCountyVoice.com. That's just a great resource to just find out almost anything going yeah. on, really, isn't yeah. it? Anything else uh, before we wrap up that uh, you'd like folks that's coming up uh, outside of the levy or anything else that you want people to know about uh, before we visit again next in yeah. November? No, this is, um, I, you know, I think one of the things that makes our community 
strong is um, our, and, I, and I've said it a few times tonight, but our collective commitment to, to one another and to our community. Um, and um, it's um, the reason we have such, um, a, such a wide variety of programs that are represented here tonight. Um, and um, it's the reason why Missoula is a great place to live and work. Um, because of um, the dedicated efforts, um, you know, it's not, it's not an accident. It doesn't just happen. It happens with intentionality. It happens with investment. It happens with deliberate um, actions and, and um, deliberately standing up programs that help, uh, help people make their lives better. Um, I have also often said that local government can be a transformative force for good um, in the lives of, of the residents that we serve. Um, and these programs are tangible um, examples of day in and day out people's lives being improved by, by local government programs. Um, so um, really all I want to say is I want to thank everyone who runs these programs and uh, makes, um, makes this good work happen um, and makes our community such a wonderful place. All right. Thank you very much, Mayor. Appreciate it. I want to thank you again for uh, giving us some of your valuable time to talk about some issues that are, are good. And we want to invite people to always come by. Uh, we're here on the fourth Wednesday. I haven't looked at the Thanksgiving schedule. I think we're off in November and December. Yeah, I think we might um, be off in November, in December, back in January. So, But I want to thank Joel Baird and his crew from MCAT. Of course, these uh, discussions will be online as well, so that's a good place to go uh, to look for that and uh, also share some of that information, which will also be up on various websites and links and all that sort of stuff as well. So we appreciate everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all of you for coming by uh, from the various programs and uh, providing us the that very valuable snapshot of what the, the work you do, and thank you so much for all of your efforts, especially under these uh, these last two, two almost three really unsettled years. I know it hasn't been uh, easy out there, so thank you very much. And again, thanks to Joel and the crew for being here. Thanks for all the city staff for organizing. And uh, by all means, let us know what you think of the program. If you have suggestions about what you'd like to see us uh, tackle in 2023, topics and those kinds of things, you can always get a hold of the city and uh, let us know on that. So, again, thanks for being with us, and thanks for joining us for Wednesdays with the Mayor. Good night.